Good evening, brothers and sisters. How is everyone? Good. Thank you, VJ, for your beautiful um, leadership in prayer there, calling on the Holy Spirit. Um, and that's my prayer. My prayer tonight is that I will um, be a worthy instrument to um, help to unbind the, the knots in our hearts um, and unbound us so that we can love freely, so that we can be freely with the Lord um, and give that freedom to other people. So thank you for your prayer um, for me as I pray for you as we um, hear the words that the Lord has for us today. So this is, uh, who's, who's here for the first time? Anyone? Okay, well welcome, thank you for coming. Uh, what we are doing is over these last, um, this is the third talk in a series of five talks and we're exploring the Unbound series written by Neil Lozano. And I'm just sharing a little bit of what I have learned in this journey. I'm certainly not um, an expert. I'm your sister who's walking with you. Um, I am also called to serve as um, the founder of the Goretti Group. So we, we also reach into the life of St. Maria Goretti uh, for intercession, for example, and for inspiration as we, as we move along. So the first week we talked uh, quite a bit about repentance and the, that change of attitude, change of mindset that is grounded in the reality that Christ has already won the victory, that we are, um, we are in a new land, that, and in that, that land is the law of love. Um, so our role in that, uh, for those of us who have um, chosen Christ already, is to continue on in that walk and hopefully um, we ourselves, God willing, will cross that line of victory one day, not by ourselves, but with a bus of those who the Lord has entrusted to us. So we, we come um, understanding that we have a daddy in heaven who has, um, who has gone through the rubble of that building that has crumbled down upon us to, um, to rescue us, a daddy that has come to get us and he will continue to, to seek after us, right? So that was the first, um, the first talk. That was the, the theme of the first talk. And then the second, um, we really went into forgiveness more. And forgiveness being that releasing of the, the bitterness. Um, I, I spoke in the first talk as well about my daughter who had had a tick on the back of her neck. And we made an, a lot of analogies to the spiritual life in that, in that, um, in that instance. And so in forgiveness, we, what we do is we go to that, that wound and that we pull out that tick of bitterness and of anger and all of those things, that resentment that we oftentimes feel toward people that have hurt us. And we let that wall come down so that we can receive the ultimate um, mercy and forgiveness, which is his Christ itself, Christ is mercy. Um, as well, we looked at the power of forgiveness, the power that can take a a man who is a son of God, uh, but had walked so far willfully away in the Nazi um, extermination camp that he was responsible for tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of lives um, up until his, his last um, probably few months. But it was, it was the act of human forgiveness in the prison in, in um, Poland that started to change his heart and that allowed him to repent and move back into a relationship with God. And so that's what we want. We want to, um, we want to walk in the Lord. We want to love our enemies in a way that we want them in heaven with us. We want our enemies to be in heaven next to us. <laughs> and so that was, Maria Gretti said that on her deathbed. She said, um, yes, I forgive Alessandro. And I hope he's in heaven with me someday. I hope he's in paradise. And she was able to smile at him, you know. So we're on a journey, you know. We're probably, we may or may not be there right now, but that's, that's where we're, we're wanting to go. And that's, these are those, the first couple of keys were repentance, that changing of that mindset, forgiveness. And these keys are all keys that are 
Um, the analogy that Neil Lozano uses is keys to unlock the door. I, I'm taking it kind of a step um, further or different and just talking specifically about our hearts, the keys that will unlock uh, our hearts to fully receive the sacred heart of Jesus, to fully receive um, that love that is pure. So the third key that we're going to talk about today is repentance. Um, but before we do that, I, I felt the Lord inspiring me last talk uh, to share a story. And then I got some confirmation on that, that I was meant to, to send it. And I got permission to give testimony of, 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 a, uh, of a woman who um, has a powerful testimony. So he, here it is. Um, and I pray, Lord, that you open up hearts to receive whatever the message is for each of us um, through, through her testimony. So Dawn, I was able to, um, I was given permission to share her name. And, and the reason why, as I was praying about this today, the reason why I think her name is so important to share is that Dawn has such significance. You know, the dawn of a new day, the dawn of a new era. So Dawn, um, I think her name just, you could give a whole, you know, you could do a whole meditation, a whole week's retreat probably on her name alone, Dawn, but you'll see um, through her testimony why, um, why probably one of the reasons why her, uh, the Lord had her named that. So Dawn grew up in a very abusive, both emotionally and physically abusive household and never received that love that she was intended to receive, that each of us are intended to receive, the love, the pure love of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And so as she went on in life, she looked to other places to receive that love. And from her testimony, she says that she began to look to physical, to men um, for that, that love that was lacking from the love of her father. And so she said that she believed the lie that in order for her to um, ever have a man marry her, that she would need to be physical with him so that he would know um, that aspect of, of who she was and then would accept her. And so she proceeded on in several different relationships and eventually one of those relationships um, ended up conceiving a child. And at the time, uh, the young man was not, uh, he said he wasn't ready to be a father, and she said she wasn't ready to be a mother, and so they thought it was the, the best thing to do to um, have an abortion, and he thought it would be a responsible thing for him to do to help her to get to the abortion. Now, Dawn didn't have any kind of uh, background in faith, and she, um, so she wasn't feeling like she was conflicted in the decision at all. She just, it seemed like the, the wise thing to do. This is what the world told her. This was what was before her. So she went into uh, the abortion facility and had the procedure done, as, as she, she says, and that, as her mindset was. And she says she walked in there um, one way and then walked out a completely broken, a completely broken woman. To, for this simple procedure that was supposed to remove a, a blob of, of cells from her, her body. Dawn proceeded to fall into a deep depression. She said she cried all the time. And then one night, um, well, she also said that she very much busied herself. So rather than go into that pain and deal with the pain and face the pain, of what she was feeling, this dark depression, this darkness that she was going through, and this alienation and isolation that she felt, because no one knew except two people. She said one person uh, was an atheist, the other was a Christian, but was not uh, very vocal, was very personal in their, in their walk. Um, I'm sure they were praying for her and wishing her well, but she was very, very, feeling very, very alone uh, through the, this whole process. And then one night she said that just out of nowhere, she, like a prayer came. And again, she, was, she didn't pray regularly, but she said in her prayer just came, God, I'm sorry for destroying your gift. And then from that moment, her, she got into um, alcohol to try to 
to ease some of the pain and some of the depression and, and was in alcohol, busying herself, trying to do whatever she could to just survive. She was just trying to survive, um, having kind of fallen into this lie and falling that, that her motherhood um, was not real. And then what happened was, um, shortly after um, she was hitting, you know, kind of rock bottom, she got kicked out of her house, she was staying at friends' houses, a friend of hers asked her if she would like to sing in the choir, and Dawn loved to sing, she was short on money, and she, what she said was that um, she said, well, I can keep singing and it's free, I don't have to pay anyone to, you know... <laughs> So she said, okay, I'll, I'll do this. And so she began singing in a Catholic church in a choir. And through this singing experience, VJ knows singing is praying twice, um, she became more familiar with what the faith was and who Jesus was and how much that Jesus loved her. And so that became her turning point to um, enter into a relationship with, with God and with Jesus. And then... She decided she would enter into the Catholic faith, and she went, in, went through RCIA, the Rite for Christian Initiation. And then she had a move, and when she had a move, she had an opportunity to start new. And so during this move and this new opportunity, she said, you know what? I'm going to give God my love life. I'm going to give God the future of my marriage. I'm going to give God my whole self. I'm going to give it all to him and, and trust him with it. So she was on this journey, and around the same time, um, some of you know powerhouse Peggy here, who, <laughs> who is an amazing intercessor for prayer and just an amazing apostle. apostle. And um, so Peggy was uh, involved in working with the Gretti group at the time, and she said um, that we were doing this um, race for the chase. It was this event that... Um, would help to raise prayers, raise money, and raise awareness for the beauty of God's gift of sexuality and purity. Um, and there was a run involved where we would team together to run in public races, and then there was also a retreat that was put on. And so, um, so she, Dawn wasn't a runner, but she was like, okay, so she came. And during this retreat, um, this is where it's just so amazing how God comes and and gets us um, she was there was eucharistic adoration the eucharist was exposed and there was music but in this instance she felt like she wasn't supposed to be praising she she felt like she had a very internal um, direction to remain silent and remain still and so she was in the back and while others were praying and singing uh, she remained in silence and she said she had her eyes closed, and then um, when she opened her eyes, she saw Jesus holding her son. And then she, she stood up, and as she stood up, her son came running to her and said, It's okay, Mommy. I love you. This was extraordinary, but I just have to say that God is everywhere in the extraordinary all the time. And so for each of us, what a beautiful, beautiful reminder of how much God loves us and how personal he is. While this was Dawn's experience and this was part of Dawn's journey, and she's, Dawn, following that, went through a, um, a large discernment process where she was doing, I think she called it something like the nun hunt or the nun run. <laughs> she went on a nun run where she was discerning her vocation and checking out all these different orders and, and they encouraged her to, um, to do a Rachel's Hope, um, Rachel's Vineyard um, retreat where she received additional healing um, and eventually she discerned a, a vocation with a wonderful um, man and is in the vocation of marriage with a, a beautiful daughter, um, Veronica. So praise God. Praise God. And sometimes I, f I feel like we feel like we are so 
we're either far gone or we're so harassed or so whatever our affliction is, whether it's fear or lust or whatever it is, whether we're willfully sinning, whether we're trying not to sin, we just feel like hopeless sometimes. And so in those moments, just try to think of this story maybe and, and call to mind that truth that God is constantly, constantly, constantly after us. He's constantly seeking us out. And all we need to do is open our hearts and try to listen to him directly and try to listen to those that he sends around us to, um, to receive his love and to turn back um, to him and walk, walk with him. Um, so as we talk about, there's a few things that we can kind of pull out of her story as well as we talk about um, renunciation, which is the third key that we're going to focus on today. So many of us who are Catholic um, have, are very familiar with those promises that she made when she came into the church on Easter, Easter Vigil. And, and we, are, we renew our baptismal promises each year. And so those words uh, sound something like um, where we renounce Satan in all his works and all his empty promises. So all of those empty promises, especially around the area of sexuality, um, when we're lonely, I remember, uh, yeah, I've had my, my journey as well, and, and he'll, that enemy will find his way through our loneliness, through our self-doubt, as we get older and older. I, got, I was married when I was 36, um, so there's plenty of room for him to, to maneuver his way in, in the way that he does with his empty promises, uh, his lies about um, who I was, his lies about um, my beauty, my lack thereof, all of that. Um, so we'll talk about being able to recognize some of those ways that he uh, tries to deceive us so that we can avoid sort of falling into um, those vulnerabilities that have the ticks that attach to us. But so we talk about um, our baptismal promises and we talk about that reality, especially here during Lent, that we are in a spiritual battle um, and that there is an enemy. And so, you know, St. Ignatius of Loyola was a soldier and he talked a lot about a military kind of um, military uh, examples of the spiritual battle. Um, and I will say that I think one of the biggest tactics of any uh, enemy, of any commander, is to first, you know, if, if, if there's not even a war, if you don't even know you're in war, then your guard is going to be completely down. If you don't think there's an enemy after you, then you're going to be going about your way, doing your thing, and not guarded at all. So I would say the first tactic that the enemy has is to just completely hide himself in a way that we don't even think that he exists or don't even um, know that he exists. But the reality is we know that there is an enemy of God and that Lucifer um, was a beautiful angel in heaven who um, disobeyed God and encouraged others to disobey with him. And he became Satan and he has those fallen angels um, at his beck and call in fear to send out... Um, to, to try to disturb us, you know, in different ways. Now, as I was preparing this talk, I was getting a little bit like, hmm, I don't know how much I want to talk about the devil. It's not a very nice thing to talk about. <laughs> um, and, but the reality, one of the, one of the things I saw on the internet, which I will, will share with you, was a testimony of a priest. Um, his name was Father Pierre. Um, and he talked about balance so that we... Don't get too caught up in focusing on the enemy. We need to focus on Christ. But we need to not ignore that the fact that the enemy can influence us. And I'll go back to the example of my daughter and that tick. So that tick was in the back of her neck. Um, it would be a good, it would have been a good thing for myself or my husband to have inspected our kids after they were running through the woods and stuff. So what should we do on a regular basis to make sure that we don't have any ticks that have attached themselves to us throughout the day? Well, a good, good way to do that would be to, 
do a regular examination of conscience. And many, of, many of you may already be doing that, but just to go through the day and, Lord, where did I meet you today? You know, how did I, um, how did I receive your love today? How did others come, come to me, who came to me, how did I respond to them in their need? Um, so to ask the Holy Spirit to open our hearts to kind of do a self-inspection to make sure that we, you know, look in the mirror and make sure we don't have any ticks <laughs> that are attached to us. But when we do have that tick that's on us, I know when I saw that tick on the, the back of my daughter's neck, I was like a little bit taken back, right? Um, but I knew that her health was also at risk there. There was the, a disease that could have come through. So I needed to focus in for a few minutes to pull that bad boy out. <laughs> um, but then if I was all focused in on the tick and I was so paralyzed with fear for the tick, then it wouldn't have done my, my daughter any good. So we have to have this balance of focusing on it just long enough you know, to, to have that thing pulled out and then move on um, about our merry way. And there's also probably an inappropriateness that we could move into that would be um, a sort of agitation and worry about having ticks around us all the time. So there's, there's got to be a balance, and, and Jesus, of course, will, will root us in that balance. Uh, St. Ignatius of Loyola also talked about, he categorized temptation into three different areas, um, and that was the flesh, um, the enemy, and the world. And one of the things that I, I do really like about um, the Unbound model is that, and we'll talk about kind of the formula that is used in, in the prayer in a little bit, but I like that it kind of effectively addresses both um, the deliverance of that tick out of me, but all, all, at the same time, my flesh, the flesh. So when we're talking about the flesh, we're talking about sensuality, um, disorder, desires for food for, that's one of my areas, um, for uh, you know, our sexual desire, anything that is walking away from the plan of God that wants to give us life and love. Um, these things are good. You know, food is good. Um, sexual intimacy is good and beautiful and true. You know, in Genesis, God said I, that he made all of it and it was good. He said, go, go um, be fruitful and multiply. These things are good and beautiful. Um, but they but the, but the enemy likes to um, attack us with disorder in that. And so um, one, of the, uh, one of the ways that we can um, be more aware in this spiritual battle is to understand what some of the tactics of the enemy is. Um, does anyone have any thoughts on what that might look like? discouragement. Who here has ever felt discouragement? That happened to you again. <laughs> I did that again? And then you hear this voice like, you idiot. <laughs> that's not, that's not God. <laughs> that's either our, maybe partially our own, you know, flesh, but that could definitely be the enemy trying to, anyone else have any thoughts? Jealousy, oh my gosh, that's a big one. Because we're the body of Christ, and we're meant to share our gifts and to celebrate each other. And when we break each other down, and when we um, have envy and jealousy, and we're, that causes uh, such great division, right? So, um, you, you know, I'm better than you over there. That person thinks they're better. That's that division that the enemy wants to divide and conquer us through. Anyone else want to share anything? Impatience. Ooh, I've been dealing with that one myself lately <laughs> with my poor kiddos. I'm like, oh, dang it. I, you know, and then discouragement comes after you're impatient. <laughs> and then so anyone else? Distraction. That's a big one, right? So um, who got distracted when they were on their way here today, maybe? That happens sometimes on the way to like a retreat or something where the enemy knows that, you know, you're going to get some, that God wants to speak to your heart, wants to heal you. And uh, so he's going to say, come over here, look over here, you know. Anyone else? Desires, yes. Yeah, so he can take our desires and try to, um, through our wounds, try to um, kind of reorder them in a way that is not um, aligned with, with God. 
So that can be confusing sometimes. In the Bible, it talks about um, when Jesus went into the desert to be tempted, the, the words of the enemy, um, the, the words that Satan used were, if you, were the, if you are the son of God, then do this. If you are the son of God, then that. If you are, if you are, are you sure you're the son of God? Are you sure, are you sure you're a daughter of God? Are you, are you sure? Are you sure that God loves you? I don't, I don't know, because you've been having some really bad things happening in your life, so I don't know if I would trust that God. What do you think? He did this, he, he allowed this. How can a good God allow that? No, he doesn't love you. Maybe those people over there that go to church all the time, but not you. Anyone else? Fear, that's a biggie. Love casts out all fear. And that fear can be crippling. That fear is, yeah, those fears and those anxieties, all the possibilities that could happen if, 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 if maybe God doesn't love you and he's not going to take care of you then there's that fear, this could happen, and this could happen, and all these negative things could happen. Are there any other ways that we can think of where the enemy, what the enemy uses for tactics? Doubt, self-doubt, doubting him. Definitely doubt. Anyone else? Disguising evil as a positive. Okay, so we have to pause and talk about this because it's huge on it's huge on the personal level. So, so the enemy he attacks us personally, right? But then he takes it out to our family, and then he takes it out to society, right? And so he manipulates words so that the words have different meanings, and he goes into the wound so that if the truth comes into that wound, that the that defends the truth, then that accusation can come that oh, this, this truth is really about tearing this person apart. So, so let's, let's, talk about, um, let's talk about abortion um, with love that in some way I think we all take, um, can take some responsibility for what is happening to our children, to our women, to our fathers, um, to our brothers, to our sisters in our midst, that this is um, beyond. I, t- I, took a, uh, I took a course in college um, at the Naval Academy called Germany and the Nazi Experience, and it was the study of how the German people could allow the extermination of Jews kind of in their midst and to study them. And I, ha- I came to a point where I came to this reality that I understand the gift of human life from conception. And so if I'm not speaking the truth about life, then I'm falling into that same trap, that social pressure that makes us mute, silences us and alienates us and accuses us of something other than love. When in in truth, we need to speak... um, to speak in love. So the wound that the enemy uses with that is what? One of the many probably, but one of the big wounds that the enemy uses is the division between man and woman. So if you go back to Adam and Eve and and the first sins and the fall and the lust that came and the shame that came, um, what also came was the statement, something to the effect of, your desire will be for your husband and he will rule over you. And so that reality has played out. It has played out um, so that many girls, many women have, um, have been wronged and, and abused and continue to be um, through human trafficking, through lots of different things throughout the world, right? And so there's that wound that a woman and many women know that they have been mistreated, right? But then what does the enemy do? 
he comes in, he takes that reality that women have been mistreated, and he says, well, now, women, you have to fight for your rights. You have to lay down your motherhood. So suddenly, motherhood is something that is not valued, and that is, the, that is really the greatest gift. Whether we have a, f- a physical child or not, every woman is gifted with, with a gift of motherhood. And it starts in our bodies, and we, we have a, a natural desire that to nurture, to suffer for the sake of giving good. And so, um, yes, that twisting of truth to say that, to say that um, the, the words that are used now is my, my body, my choice, um, those words um, are the lie of the enemy. So thank you, thank you for saying that. I didn't know that I was um, supposed to give this message um, in this way tonight, but praise the Lord. Lord, you use it for whatever um, you, you need to use it for. The same thing is happening um, in the area of racism. Um, racism, I, I think I mentioned last, last time or the time before that I, I've personally, um, that's been a big wound in my life the wound of racism having been a receipt of of racism, a person who's been been on the um, receiving end. But I'll say that um, the enemy takes that and he likes to twist that to um, to move our identity. And he does this with with all all forms of abuse to that our identity becomes a victimhood identity. And that is not of God. And so um, we need to be in the truth so that we can, this isn't about who's right or who's wrong, this is about loving by giving people and ourselves um, Jesus, who is the way, the truth, and the life. And we cannot be intimidated by what culture tells us today about what is true and what is not true. It is clear um, what is true if, if you're walking with the Lord um, and you're in prayer, we, um, we need to, with love and compassion, proclaim the truth in our workplaces, in our churches. Um, and I've, I've been definitely feeling that myself um, lately in, uh, in the workplace. So he deceives, he disorders. Oh my gosh, if you'd see my car or my house right now, you would think that the devil is all over that place because there is major disorder. Uh, but no, he does. He takes, he takes what is order, what, which is meant to bring peace, and he disorders it. And that is an area I need to work on. So um, I want to read a quote from you uh, from St. Ignatius of Loyola. And it's um, number 326 in the, uh, the spiritual exercises, which are wonderful if you haven't had an opportunity to, uh, to go on those. Um, so they're talking about the enemy. He seeks to remain hidden and does not want to be discovered. When the enemy of our human nature tempts a soul with his wiles and seductions, he earnestly desires that they, may, that they be received secretly and kept secret. It's also a biggie. But if one manifests them to a confessor or some other spiritual person who understands his deceits and malicious designs, the evil one is very much vexed. For he knows that he cannot succeed in his evil undertaking once his evident deceits have been revealed. So that's like that moment where we saw the tick in my daughter's neck and we saw the little legs and the tick felt, you know, he maybe saw the light. I don't know if they can see or not, but um, we lifted up the hair behind her neck and that tweezer went on there. He's like, uh-oh, they're going to pull me out now. I've been, I've, it's been revealed. And so this is um, what, what the, uh, the key number three, renunciation, um, helps to do. So we are recognizing um, that spiritual tick that needs to come out, and we are renouncing in the name of Jesus. We're saying, you got you gots to go. You, I'm not going to. Um, I'm not going to house you here. Uh, you're not going to suck my spiritual blood. 
um, you have to leave. So it's showing, it's showing the enemy that door. I, w I would say one example might be uh, for a married man or a married woman who um, is in an unfaithful relationship and comes to the realization that they need to, um, that they love their spouse and they, they, and they repent of their, their misdeeds. Um, that renunciation would be that call that breaks, you know, that says we can't, I'm, you know, this is, we've mistreated one another by being unfaithful. Um, this relationship is now over. Um, we're done. So fear, we're done. We're done fear. I'm not, I am not going to be in a relationship with you anymore. Doubt, I'm done. I'm done with you. I renounce in the name of Jesus. Doubt. Um, so all of those things that are, that are not of God. And then the second step, which we'll talk about um, next week, my husband might be coming to do that talk. We'll see. But um, the second step would be breaking the power. So the second step would be breaking that unho unholy bond. And maybe that would be, um, I don't know, deleting them from the phone or moving away or doing something that's a little bit um, more from the will um, to, to remove that, that evil influence in our lives. So renouncing the spirit tells them that they will no longer have a hiding place. Um, we will no longer give them a hiding place once that they've been revealed. Um, and then, so in the name of Jesus, we talk about specifically in the unbound model, um, you'll say, I renounce the spirit of fear. In the name of Jesus, I renounce the spirit of fear. And, and why are we using the name of Jesus? Anyone have any? There is power in the name of Jesus. Romans 10 um, and, and Acts also. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Um, in the name of Jesus in Philippians, at the name of Jesus, every knee should bend and every tongue confess. And there's another, I'm not sure where the other quote um, comes from, but it, it, it might be part of the Philippians um, verse, but it talks about um, every knee should bend, and, and we're talking about not only on earth, but in heaven and under heaven. So the, the demons in the, at the name of Jesus are going to, um, they are going to submit in the name of, in the name of Jesus. Um, the other important thing is to speak it out to, to um, not just have it in your heart, but actually to speak it, because when you speak it, it is heard. Um, apparently, demons cannot, cannot read our minds. So when it is spoken out, it has, it has more force um, that goes with it. And then the other thing as we kind of walk through it is that we want to try to give as much detail as possible when we're, we're, we're naming it because then it reveals, it kind of takes out that flashlight and, on the hiding place to, to show exactly where it was, where it is. Um, and I'd like to walk us through a, a little exercise in a moment, but before we do, I think I'm supposed to share with you um, what happened in my own walk this week and what's been happening in my own walk um, these, these past few weeks, so, um, and really for the last, like, 20 years, maybe, um, and I have definitely been battling the spirit of fear, um, on many levels, probably most intensely in, like, 2008 or so, following, um, a couple of miscarriages I had, and just a very big imbalance in my in my, my body and so forth. Um, and then 2012, I felt like some things were kind of revealed to me where some of those triggers were coming from and there were certain things that, you know, kind of helped along the way. Um, but I kept feeling two things around speaking. And I, I used to give talks a long time ago um, for like an, I think it was like a three or four year period um, you know, a couple times a month probably um, on relationships. But I would always go through this process of just completely feeling paralyzed and really muted. Like I had stuff in there, but it was like I just like, couldn't get it out or I couldn't prepare. Like it was just, to some degree, it's, um, 
I think it's natural, you know, to have this, but there, I felt like there was something more there. Um, and so anyway, I, I did read at one point that, um, and it made me feel better because I also had this sadness that I was experiencing a lot um, and depression. And, um, and I had read that there's kind of, you know, different ways that the enemy will attack us. And if we're not kind of walking with him yet, sometimes those will be like through sensuality and um, kind of the ways of the world. But if we've really like committed ourselves to walking away from that, um, then the enemy can kind of harass us. And, um, and that's what I felt like I was experiencing. And so this week, I, um, I woke up at like 2.30 in the morning, and I've been just really kind of trying to be self-aware to, um, to do what I've, to, and I've prayed the five keys like probably 20 times throughout these past couple weeks. And so I went into the five keys, and I... I really asked the Holy Spirit to kind of point me into something that, um, a new level of liberation that, that maybe he wanted me to experience. And, and I was feeling, I could feel it in my body that I wasn't free, that, that there was something. And I was, because I could feel my shoulders kind of like crinched up in fear. Like I was afraid of something, but I didn't have anything to really be afraid of. And so I, I said, our Holy Spirit, just please take me back. Um, if there's a memory or whatever it is, just help me to go, go deep into that um, wound, if it's a wound or a sin, whatever it is, please just reveal it to me. Um, and what he, what he took me back to was a couple of different things. One was um, when I went to the conference for um, Unbound a few years ago, what came up to me was the forgiveness of my dad, who's wonderful. I love him. I'm not here at all to, to give him a bad name. Um, but, and God rest his soul. But I had this, this reality come up that I needed to forgive my dad for the way that he had treated my mom, my perception of how he treated my mom. And so... My parents were elderly at this time, and so I really didn't want to bring anything on him that was going to cause him any pain. But I did want to try to address it in whatever way God wanted me to address it. And so I prayed about that, and I prayed about that. And then I went home to, um, to visit them, and my deepest desire was that my parents would, that my kids would have this wonderful relationship with my parents. I was always very close to both of them, and they would just know how awesome their, their grandparents are, how wonderful they are. And so we're home. Um, my sister is wonderful, is taking care of my, my parents in this little apartment. Um, and she lives in, in Texas on a lot of land. And so we're in this little space. And it, I think it's cold at this time. And my kids were, it was a few years ago. So they were young. And so there were being kids in the house. And um, something happened. And my dad um, yelled at my daughter. And, um, you know, said, like, that's enough or something. And all of this stuff of my little girl from having been yelled at came up, you know. And I was like, Ugh! and I said, Dad, you do not yell at my daughter, you know. And, um, and then I, like, stood up, and I, like, went over to the door, and, like, I wanted to leave. I was like, I can't leave. And then I'm like, go into the, you know, go into the room. I'm like, okay, can you go, like, give me something. <laughs> Just, like, trying to pray and, um, and then, like, calm down. And then it went in that incident um, just led us into a really beautiful conversation with my parents and really a lot it opened up a lot of information about my dad's childhood um, and the abuse that he experienced um, the, the abuse that he saw um, it's really a miracle that he was an such an amazing father that he was having having been abandoned by his father and then having his step uh, father, you know, beat his mother, you know, when he was 10 and couldn't do anything about it. But so like that, when I was praying at 2.30 in the morning, that came up and then it brought me in, the Holy Spirit brought me in deeper to this, um, what I sensed 
was like some level, don't take this the wrong way, but the curse of criticism. And so I felt like I needed to, I had forgiven my dad, but I felt like I needed to say out loud that I forget in the name of Jesus, I forgive dad um, for, for the curse of criticism. And, um, and something like released, you know, when I, when I did that. Um, and then that took me into another instance where um, I had, so one of my dreams was to play college basketball. And I wanted to put myself through school. And in seventh grade, I started to um, like practice and stuff so I could get recruited to go somewhere and play. And so my senior year, someone came to, um, to look at one of the other players and expressed interest. And um, so I came home all excited, and I was like, Dad, there were, there were um, scouts at the Naval Academy, um, and they, they were there to, you know, to look at Jane, but they um, expressed interest in me too. And, and my dad said, do you know what kind of grades you need to get um, to get into that place? And, um, and it totally crushed me because it was also, and this is how the enemy works, um, it, it touched a wound from another uh, issue that I have with, it had been gluten, this is a long story, but, um, but the gluten has um, had an effect on me neurologically, so I could, was never a great um, student, I was always the last one to get things, and that created a false identity for me, and a wound that I wasn't good enough, so when dad, like, said that, it went to my grades, which was also, you know, this negative thing, um, and and, I, and it came to this reality of failure academically. So all of this to say, this is actually a really cool thing that happened next, to give you all this background, um, that the Lord gave me the detail and he gave me the words that I kind of swam through but eventually said, um, in the name of Jesus, uh, I renounce the spirit of criticism. In the name of Jesus, um, I renounce the spirit of failure. And when I said that, my phone in the kitchen in the other room went ding. <laughs> and, then, um, and then I prayed through more and came to this, um, this reality of the need to renounce in the name of Jesus. I renounced the spirit of mute. I felt like, like I was being muted. And as soon as I said that out loud, and this wasn't like right after each other. Like the second that I said that, it went ding. <laughs> um, and so that was just like a real, and, and since then I've had this, um, just a really deep sense of gratitude and peace and a feeling of liberation. Um, and so it's so beautiful. I wanted to share that with you because it's not just for me. It's, this is something that God is offering to all of us. Um, and in this simple model that, that um, is laid out in Unbound, um, I, I really appreciate it because in another way, too, um, St. Maria Gretti is such a simple figure. She was, um, she was not an intellectual. She was not famous. She was a farm girl, and she did her duties with love. Um, and so I love the simplicity of that, and... Um, I try, I try to respond to the Holy Spirit and what the Goretti group is meant to be with a simple model, too, of, of sacraments, formation in mind, body, and soul, um, and fellowship. And so that, that is something that um, is dear to my heart, that simplicity, and I think it's something that we can all appreciate um, in our lives. So with that... Um, if maybe we could all stand up and we'll try to walk through just a little bit of an exercise that might help us um, to get some dings. <laughs> Probably we'll take, you know, God will, in your own time, will take you on your walk. Um, in his own time, I mean. Um, but let's open our hearts to um, possibility of something starting right here and right now. Come Holy Spirit. We ask that you open up our hearts to um, the gift that you have for us tonight, for each of us, each of your daughters, 
each of your sons here present, Heavenly Father. Uh, we ask that you shine that light, that beautiful light that shines forth from the sacred heart of Jesus, that shines forth from the immaculate heart of Mary, that shines forth from the heart of St. Joseph, that pure and beautiful love. Just let that love shine forth into our hearts right now and open up our hearts especially those areas of woundedness that we, um, we may need to forgive people around. And I invite you as I kind of go through some of these um, things that we may need to renounce, um, you can say it with me and then just kind of note if there's something that moves you emotionally um, that you can take to prayer later that you you might want to take um, to prayer if it's something more serious definitely take to um, the confessional where you will receive great healing and renewal and restoration so i'll say what it is and then together after i say it once then we can um, together say in the name of jesus i renounce the spirit of the first one is um, anger. Maybe there's somebody who has really harmed you and your heart is filled with anger for them or maybe it's um, a situation in society, um, an injustice that you're seeing rolled out in your workplace, in your family, among your friendships. So together we'll say, in the name of Jesus, I renounce the spirit of anger. We'll do it three times. In the name of Jesus, I renounce the spirit of anger. In the name of Jesus, I renounce the spirit of anger. next one is pride all the different manifestations of pride whether they be arrogance self-righteousness rebellion perfectionism independence oh, I'm a self thinker perfectionism superiority stubbornness open our hearts Lord to your truth of what might be embedded in our hearts so that it can come out and we can be free, Lord, to love you and to love others as you would love. In the name of Jesus, I renounce the spirit of pride. In the name of Jesus, I renounce the spirit of pride. In the name of Jesus, I renounce the spirit of pride. Next one is fear. There's all kinds of ways that can manifest, especially now when there's so many unknowns. And we want to just be in control of our lives. There's so many things that can go wrong. And what the Lord wants to remind us of is the words that Our Lady of Guadalupe said to, um, to little Juan Diego. And, and that those words were, am I not your mother? Do I not have you in the palm of my hand? So in any way, if, if fear has taken hold of our heart, if it, the tick of fear is is sucking our spiritual lifeline. Um, we want to take responsibility um, right now for showing fear the door. In the name of Jesus, I renounce the spirit of fear. In the name of Jesus, I renounce the spirit of fear. In the name of Jesus, I renounce the spirit of fear. Then 
The next one is shame and self-hatred. Shame can um, manifest itself so strongly um, with the sins that are more grave and um, they can, shame can also um, present itself and, and suck our blood when, um, when we've been abused um, through no fault of our own. So we want to we want to call that out. Um, we want to, um, if we've I- identified with that shame in any way, this is our opportunity to dis I- disidentify, to disallow it, to suck um, from our spiritual lifeline. Any guilt that is not of God, you know, like guilt is there um, only as a good thing when it when it moves us to turn back to God. That shame is more about self hatred, um, as we define it. So we want to um, tell shame that it it needs to go. Um, That shame can manifest itself in feelings of embarrassment, humiliation, um, maybe especially when we are trying to do our best to um, follow Jesus um, and speak truth when he he tells us to. Um, So it can also manifest in accusation against us. So shame, in the name of Jesus, I renounce the spirit of shame. In the name of Jesus, I renounce the spirit of shame. In the name of Jesus, I renounce the spirit of shame. The next one is rejection and loneliness. We'll do those together. This can come through um, having been abandoned, maybe by someone in a relationship who we trusted, or maybe by a parent, feeling unwanted and unloved. Loneliness, um, if we're not connected to the vine or to the family of God. In the name of Jesus, I renounce the spirit of rejection. In the name of Jesus, I renounce the spirit of rejection. In the name of Jesus, I renounce the spirit of loneliness. In the name of Jesus, I renounce the spirit of loneliness. Judgment. This can manifest through criticism, comparison, jealousy. In the name of Jesus, I renounce the spirit of judgment. In the name of Jesus, I renounce the spirit of judgment. In the name of Jesus, I renounce the spirit of judgment. The next one is uh, infirmity. Um, in those ways that we um, are physically broken um, and the enemy tries to come in and um, bind us in that, especially if there are thought patterns that contribute to um, to that in- infirmity. In the name of Jesus, I renounce the spirit of infirmity. In the name of Jesus, I renounce the spirit of infirmity. Suicide. In the name of Jesus, I renounce the spirit of suicide. In the name of Jesus, I renounce the spirit of suicide. In the name of Jesus. 
I renounce the spirit of suicide. We'll just, there's a lot. We'll do just a few more. We'll pray on which ones we should do. Confusion. In the name of Jesus, I renounce the spirit of confusion. In the name of Jesus, I renounce the spirit of confusion. In the name of Jesus, I renounce the spirit of confusion. Religious pride. In the name of Jesus, I renounce the spirit of religious pride. In the name of Jesus, I renounce the spirit of religious pride. We'll do two more. In the name of Jesus, I renounce the spirit of addiction. In the name of Jesus, I renounce the spirit of addiction. In the name of Jesus, I renounce the spirit of addiction. And the last one is lust in all of its manifestations. In the name of Jesus, I renounce the spirit of lust. In the name of Jesus, I renounce the spirit of lust. In the name of Jesus, I renounce the spirit of lust. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for this time that you have allowed us um, to focus in on uh, those the enemies that do not um, have my future and my prosper um, as you do. Um, we ask, Lord, that you fill us with all of the virtues um, that will help us to to fight in the spiritual battle, this, the spirit of, of purity and chastity, um, the spirit of self-control, um, the spirit of humility. We ask for that you would fill us with your Holy Spirit um, that gives us all of those beautiful virtues of faith, of hope, of love, um, and that you would continue to walk with us and to fill us, Lord. And we thank you for this time that you've opened our hearts and opened our minds and our lips to, um, to journey closer toward you during this Lent. In your most holy name we pray, amen. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, amen. All right, sorry if that went a little long, but um, what we are going to do now is have uh, prayer teams, and um, I don't know, is Father here? Okay. Um, yeah, so we, I believe we're going to expose the, the Blessed Sacrament, and again, this is, um, what a gift we have that we're back in, in the church and that um, we have with us Jesus in the Eucharist, body, blood, soul, and divinity. And we have to use our imaginations to, to, to come to that reality of the truth of what the gift that we've been given. Um, and so as we, as we sit with him and let, a, let him just love us. I like to think of it as like sunshine, not just the S-U-N, but the Son of God shine um, to just change us. And I'll be um, in some of those prayer teams, and I think we'll have some other folks too. So thank you. Love you all. <laughs>